We're all familiar with viral diseases, especially over the past two years. The deadliness and severity of a virus cannot be understated. Whether it's COVID-19, influenza, or any other of the countless infectious diseases that plague humanity. We're all familiar with the bubonic plague, the Black Death which wiped out an estimated 25 million people in the Middle Ages, a third of Europe's population at the time. But that was during an era in which medieval advances were limited to the sickening practice of bloodletting, which drained a patient of their blood until all bacteria left their system, or washing the body with vinegar. Of course, none of these methods had any effect on staving off the Black Death, and the epidemic went down in history as one of the darkest periods of civilization. But for all our technological and medical advances in the field of health and medicine, infectious diseases are still as much of a threat now as they were back then, if not a greater one. Think about it. In today's world, everything is heavily connected. Globalization means that we travel more, import more products than ever before, and with such a high population density, it's difficult to keep anything under control due to the sheer amount of people there are in the world. Complete eradication of a viral disease has proven extremely difficult in even the strictest, most regimented campaigns to do so. Vaccines, while effective, still require time to develop, roll out, and treat. Take, for example, the smallpox virus. For centuries, this deadly disease slayed entire populations, killing millions with a mortality rate of 40%. In the 20th century, the world's governments and medical organizations worked tirelessly to come up with a vaccinated cure for the disease, and their efforts eventually paid off. A successful vaccine was developed, and only the trinkling of cases of smallpox were documented in Somalia in the 1970s. Today, all that remains of the disease are contained samples held in high-security laboratories across the world, explicitly used for research purposes. But smallpox's story is not the norm. Other diseases you may not realize are still lurking in the shadows are polio and malaria. Polio being a disease affecting the central nervous system, with weakened muscle function as a result, and malaria being a mosquito-transmitted sickness that results in severe fevers and vomiting. The common perception is that these illnesses aren't actually a threat anymore, and are nothing more than a relic of the past, but that isn't quite true. While they've been eliminated from some parts of the world, in polio's case, most first-world countries such as the United States and Europe still have some documented cases that crop up from time to time. But the future is hopeful, with only under 50 cases of polio documented worldwide in the year 2018, and malaria's worldwide eradication program seeing success year by year. Maybe the world will one day be fully wiped of these terrible illnesses. But why are we telling you this during a video about the SCP Foundation? Because the subject of today's video is also a deadly virus, but unlike the most ordinary variations we just discussed, this one is going to be a lot more difficult to eradicate fully. And by difficult, we mean next to impossible. As to be expected with an organization like the SCP Foundation, the threats they deal with are both similar to the ones the rest of the world's governments and large organizations do, and entirely, completely different. If you're a seasoned viewer of SCP Explained, chances are you are already familiar with more than a few anomalous viruses. They are unspeakably deadly, incredibly strange, and can put an infected victim through more pain and suffering than anything else in the world. It's a testament to the Foundation's thoroughness and capabilities that some of these diseases are even able to be concentrated in a manageable dose and contained inside a chamber at a secure facility. But for others, they're still out there, ready to strike at a moment's notice, and there's absolutely nothing the Foundation can do about it, except be as swift as possible in their retaliation. And there's no doubt that they're prepared. With the deadliness of an anomalous virus, which can spread at a more infectious rate and potentially alert the rest of the world to the supernatural happenings of the SCP Foundation and the objects they contain, an anomalous pandemic is one of the Foundation's greatest fears. Some anomalous diseases, as we mentioned before, are under the control of the Foundation. Take SCP-008, nicknamed the Zombie Plague, for example. SCP-008 is a deadly virus that, you guessed it, can essentially turn a patient into a zombie, reanimating their corpse after the sickness kills them. What makes SCP-008 unique is that it's entirely absent from the natural world, save for the places the Foundation has labeled G2 sites. 
These G2 sites are small pockets across the world in which the Foundation discovered SCP-008, which further research of such have determined that the disease may not have originated on Earth in the first place. Subjects infected by SCP-008 display symptoms within three hours of infection, which include flu-like symptoms, preceded by a coma, which is followed by death. But after death, the victim's body will continue to display lifeless signs of mortality, including a high durability to damage and a desire to ingest living humans on physical contact, just like a zombie. Research into SCP-008 is highly classified and left out from the original document because the Foundation has the right to fear that SCP-008 may be replicated in an unsuspecting laboratory one day. As such, containment efforts to prevent such research from bearing fruit are in place, backed by the Foundation's stranglehold over the ordinary scientific world. Thankfully, SCP-008 has mostly been destroyed, with samples contained solely at the G2 sites, which are now protected Foundation facilities located across the world. But the Foundation was lucky that SCP-008 was so easily contained. If the disease spread in larger numbers or originated from a natural source on Earth, we might be living in a world more like a zombie apocalypse movie than the one we know today. On the other side of the spectrum, you have SCP-3519, the Quiet Days virus. In one reality, SCP-3519 managed to kill off the entire world due to its severity and ease of infection. Unlike most anomalous diseases, SCP-3519 was a mimetic virus, meaning that its transmission wasn't just limited to the traditional means of physical contact, but the very idea of it permeating your mind would allow it to take root inside your body. SCP-3519 permeated the idea that the world would end on March 5, 2019, and that self-termination was a preferable option than living through the apocalypse and the terrible aftermath that would follow. SCP-3519 took society by storm, and the idea was transmitted through television broadcasts and news stories encouraging people to free themselves from the world, and even Foundation sites themselves. The Foundation was powerless, and the rapid rate of transmission proved too difficult for the organization to keep fully under control. The project to create a cure was greenlit, but one by one, as Foundation sites across the globe suffered massive die-offs and a loss of personnel, the research team dwindled down until there was only one person left, a junior researcher by the name of Rory Jones, who assumed the position of O5-6 in an emergency succession protocol that would promote the next highest member of the Foundation to the position in the event of an overseer dying. Jones was the only member of the Foundation left, and as far as he knew, camped up in a cabin in the woods with nothing but a few research materials and a computer terminal, the only man alive. The SCP-3519 timeline story proves just how quickly a deadly anomalous virus can get out of control how it can make an organization as all-powerful and ever-prepared as the SCP Foundation just another statistic in a record of infected populations. But you don't need to tell the Foundation that. They're already well aware, and they've had decades to prepare, study, and analyze the effect an anomalous virus can have on the world. And that brings us to the mysterious case of the main anomaly we'll be looking at today. SCP-217, The Clockwork Virus Dr. Charles Gears, a researcher of note that you may have heard of before, was one of the Foundation's best and brightest. His cold, distant demeanor and propensity for researching the anomalous commonly associated with the divergent religion, the Church of the Broken God, a group of zealots focused on reassembling the broken metal pieces of their mechanical, technological god, made onlookers associate the Gears' name with sleek, careless alloys and methodical, cold clockwork. When the Foundation began observing symptoms of what would later be labeled SCP-217 in a major population center, whose name would be scrubbed from all official documents, they knew Dr. Gears was the right man to head the research efforts. For years, the Foundation had observed strange medical records and reports from the city. Reports of dementia in subjects younger than the common age brackets and at uncommonly high rates. High reports of lethargy, depression, emotional dulling, and a feeling of something moving underneath the skin or a ticking noise in the ear were all signs that the Foundation was dealing with SCP-217. Dr. Gears was already familiar with the disease, having worked alongside efforts to study it in the past. This was not the first major population area affected by SCP-217, and there surely were more areas up next. 
Upon arriving and reading the initial reports, Dr. Gears requested to view a subject that the Foundation believed was suffering from SCP-217. When the young woman entered, Gears immediately recognized the signs, the stiff movements, the robotic, monotone voice, and the way that nothing he seemed to say faced her. They were all clear-cut signs of SCP-217's infection. The girl was barely high school age, but she looked like she had all of her youth and life zapped out of her completely. It was a horrible sight to see. An x-ray was performed, and Gears saw for himself a definitive sign that SCP-217 had taken over her body. The x-ray imagery showed the inside of the girl's body, which had been converted from an ordinary mass of organs and tissues into a clockwork machine, composed of cogs, gears, screws, and wires. And as Gears knew, this would only get worse as time went on, with signs of her infection appearing outside the body as well as inside. Right now, there wasn't a shred of human tissue left inside her, and there was nothing the doctor could do about it. Gears thought about the girl's family, who had been anesthetized prior to the Foundation seizing their daughter for research purposes. And though the emotionless man would never let his facade down, his heart ached for her. But it wasn't only her. It was dozens of people inside the city the Foundation had documented as displaying symptoms of SCP-217. On a scale this high, there was little the Foundation could do except sit back, watch, and only act when the symptoms became too visible to hide. That was the tragedy of SCP-217, the clockwork virus. It wasn't deadly, but it was a slow, more metaphorical death, from a person made of flesh and blood to a clockwork automaton that felt more like a shell than a living thing. The Foundation was more than familiar with SCP-217, though, and multiple samples are held inside a reverse-pressure airlocked containment chamber at a high-security site for research purposes, in hopes that one day, a cure could be developed. Personnel wanting to access SCP-217 samples have to don fully insulated hazmat suits with chemical sterilization and endure a post-interaction quarantine period with physical testing. All this being mandatory after they have finished their experiments with the virus. The severity of an SCP-217 infection cannot be understated, and any items touched by infected personnel have to undergo a strict sterilization process. The Foundation is perfectly justified in this overly cautious behavior, too, because SCP-217 has an infection rate of 100%, meaning that it will transmit through physical contact all of the time without failure. But it doesn't just infect humans. The clockwork virus has been observed to infect all multicellular organisms. From the smallest insect to an elephant, SCP-217 consumes and hollows out all it can. Clockwork beings wrought from a clockwork virus, marching to the ticking of their innards in a hollow, empty world. If that sounds terrifying and like a nightmare, then congratulations. Chances are you're unaffected by SCP-217. If it sounds appealing, well, you might just be a mechanite ready to serve the Church of the Broken God, but we'll get to that connection later. SCP-217 is especially difficult to deal with due to its hardiness. It can survive for years outside a host body, and when it does find a suitable host, and trust us, there's no shortage in supply of them in the world, it can sometimes take years for symptoms of SCP-217 to manifest. It's a slow virus, and that's exactly what makes it so dangerous. The Foundation might not realize a large population area has been infected before it's too late, and that's exactly what happened before, with entire towns being infected by SCP-217. But what are those symptoms? Well, you might have already been able to guess so far that SCP-217 has to do with turning someone into a mechanical monstrosity, but there's a bit more to it than that. SCP-217 alters biochemistry in such a way that it causes organic matter to rearrange itself into an organic metal. Chemical scans of this metal reveal that there's still living cellular tissue and DNA present inside it, but it takes the appearance and feels indistinguishable from actual materials. This process occurs slowly over time, and advanced stages have shown that a subject's interior will resemble a machine, with a complicated mixture of gears and clockwork. This is subtle, barely noticed by the patient at first, with only vague feelings of confusion, insomnia, and joint stiffness. But as larger and larger parts of the body are converted, the subject experiences extreme pain. As Dr. Gears wrote in his research notes on SCP-217, 
Hearts are replaced by gears and small tubes, joints by gear networks, eyes by structures not unlike primitive hand-crake film cameras, etc. SCP-217 in non-mammals shows first on the outside of the body. In mammals such as humans, SCP-217 converts the internals before being visible on the outside of the body. The reason for this is unknown, but it might have something to do with that broken god connection we mentioned earlier. One of the church's core beliefs focuses on ascending humanity to reflect Mekane, the broken god. While the origins of SCP-217 are unknown, if the virus is related to the Mechanites, this subtle, slow infection may be a part of their grand design, a plan to covertly infiltrate society and convert the masses into effigies of their god. But of course, this is all speculation. As we mentioned, those infected by SCP-217 can be entirely unaware of their conversion until it's too late. But aside from physicality, the mental state is also affected. From the middle to advanced stages of SCP-217 infection, victims' behaviors reflect their cold, mechanical insides. They respond in a repetitive, disassociated fashion. Their actions are dull, mechanical, and telegraphed. They're easily distracted and confused, and appear irritable when faced with new problems. In the early stages, SCP-217 manifests as increased lethargy, a lack of emotional response, and a feeling of fluttering or moving underneath the skin. Always present are ticking noises, like those of a clock, that mainly manifest when SCP-217 infects the shoulders, neck, and head. But attempts to hear this noise using recording equipment have invariably failed, as the device will not pick up any sound if pressed against an affected area. As SCP-217's infection advances, the subject will experience excruciating pain, sharp, tearing sensations in the areas that are being converted into organic metal, comparable in feeling to a knife wound or a deep muscle tear. This feeling can persist for hours or days, depending on which area of the body is being affected and the subject themselves. After tearing the existing organs, the new parts will integrate into the tissue and settle into the body, producing pain. An analysis of this newly formed organic metal appears to be alloys of brass, steel, and iron varieties, but substances such as leather, rubber, glass, and wood have been observed. And observed is the key word, because as soon as these materials are examined deeper, it's revealed that they're still organic in composition, and even carry the subject's DNA. Organs and tissues affected will, however, become stronger. Instead of being squishy meat bags filled with tissue, blood, and other parts, they take on the physical properties, namely durability, of the material they resemble. If one of these areas are damaged, they'll repair over time just like regular organs, but at a much slower rate. But one interesting note is that a damaged piece of organic metal can be repaired, so to speak, by replacing damaged areas with new parts of the same type. This has had no consequences, and the body will continue to act as normal. That's one benefit of being infected by SCP-217. You can essentially repair yourself with whatever you have access to. But the conversion of a victim doesn't stop. It continues to occur until their entire body is organic metal, inside and out. Dr. Gears' research on a fully converted brain was apparently so groundbreaking that it had to be erased from the standard security class documentation. We can only speculate on what it contained. Possibly that connection to the broken god that we're so desperate to make? We don't know. But whatever it was, it hinted at something far larger than what a cursory look at SCP-217 seems to suggest. SCP-217 is truly one of the most dangerous anomalous viruses the Foundation has to deal with, having already infected hundreds of people in various population centers around the world before containment methods can be properly established. So if you happen to start hearing the sounds of a tick here and a talk there, accompanied by a strange fluttering feeling under your skin, we're sorry to say, there's not much we can do for you now. Actually, nothing. There's nothing we can do. Now go check out SCP-914 The Clockworks and SCP-001 The Broken God or Boro Cycle for more Mechanite-related videos from SCP Explained.